Hello, Andrew here. This is another short screencast just to talk about Archimedes Invariant. Archimedes Invariant was one of the key steps that Archimedes used to get his formula for the surface area of a sphere. Now, here is a sphere. What are we going to do with it? Well, what we've got to do to talk about Archimedes Invariant is to paint it with two bands. So we've got two bands on our sphere a lower band and the upper band. Let me just put that in perspective so it looks a bit more realistic. But we've got these two bands and they're not fixed. We could have bands of various location and thicknesses. But the key thing is that they have the same vertical height. So the vertical height of the top band and the vertical height of the bottom band are equal. Together we're going to say that these form a big band which is sort of like everything, the whole band from the bottom of one band to the top of the other band. Now you'll notice that these are bands are of different lengths and they're also of different widths. But what Archimedes invariant is about is the amazing fact that they actually have the same area. So Archimedes proved this on the way to proving his formula for the surface area of a sphere. So how does Archimedes do it? Well his argument was particularly ingenious but it's based on one little bit of geometry and that is this when we take this sphere and we put a cylinder around it so same diameter same height and we project our blue bands out towards the sphere that projection distorts the bands but it preserves the area so it stretches in one way shrinks in the other way and it all matches the way Archimedes proved this was really ingenious. It used every trick he had at his disposal. It used geometry, which included the method of exhaustion, but it also used physics, levers and centers of gravity. He did this because he didn't have calculus, algebra, coordinate geometry or trigonometry. So he just used the tools he had at his disposal. They were state of the art at the time. In doing this, he came up with this argument, which he was so proud of. It was one of his most uh, finest accomplishments in his view. And so much so that he had it, uh, he specified he wanted this uh, engraved on his tombstone. Now we are going to do this without using physics. We're going to have a direct geometric argument. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's just go back to the sphere and the bands. So here we go. And I've drawn a circle on the sphere and on that circle I've drawn a semicircle. Now you probably know where this is going. I'm going to turn those semicircles and make that into some loons. I'm going to make my semicircle into loons. So I better make lots of these semicircles and they're going to go all the way around what we call the big band, the bottom of one band to the top of the other band. So we've completely covered that area. Now the reason I've done that is I want to rotate the semicircle around. All right, so we're thinking about sliding our semicircles just as we have with other loon constructions and we get a transformation of the big band to itself which just rotates all of those semicircles. Now I claim that this transformation preserves area. So the area, if I take one area uh, on the surface of the sphere which is covered by those um, by those looms and then I rotate I'll get a different area it'll be a different shape but it will be the same area okay different region same area so that's what I want to do the second thing I'm going to do is talk about what happens to these two bands and I guess it's not surprising that I'll be trying to say that when I do this rotation of semicircles one of the bands becomes the other band. And because this is area preserving, I will be able to deduce that the two bands are of equal area. Now, the thing worth noting is that I'm not relying on this being any particular band. These could be different widths. They could be different locations on the sphere. I don't mind, okay? But I'm just gonna use one somewhere in the middle here. Right, that sort of nice location looks nice and familiar. So what happens when I rotate these semicircles through 180 degrees? Now, I've got a separate animation about that. So let's me play that. Here we go. Here's our surface of our sphere 
with the uh, with the disk drawn and I'm going to make a loon, a loon made on the surface of the sphere. It's actually geometrically different from the loons we saw before on the plane because of its curvature. But it has the same properties as the planar loons in the sense that we can think of them as sliding against each other. And a shape such as this ring, we can turn it inside out just as we turned the disk in the plane into, I guess, the inside out version of the disk. So this animation is just a very similar animation to what we saw with the disk that we could turn it inside out. What it does, it forms another band, but that band is the same as the one I started with, but the trick is I'm going to rotate it through 180 degrees. So this 180 degree rotation is the 180 degree rotation we saw of the semicircles earlier. And the key thing is because this is made up of a large number of loons, well, we're just rearranging them, which means we're just preserving area. And as we increase the number of loons towards infinity, we find that we've actually got the true mapping, which just rotates all the semicircles by 180 degrees. And we can deduce that that preserves area. So this transformation, which goes from here, rotates all these round, preserves area. So that's step one. We've got our area preserving transformation. Step two, we need to look at the bands. So let's, I don't know, choose some width of the bands, some location of the bands, it doesn't matter at all, right? So maybe I'll make this one, maybe about that big. I'm just going to turn perspective off for this bit because the key insight what we want to use is a particular perspective on this, um, on this arrangement. And that is that this circle here, when we look at it side on, it lies in a plane. Now that's just because when you take a sphere and you cut it with a plane, you get a circle. That's all that's going on here. So let's put the plane into this diagram. Okay, so I've put that plane in and you notice I've also put some other points and lines in here. These are just to help us understand what's going on. So I've got the four white points here. All right, so four white points. And I've also got um, the center of the circle here in a sort of a green color, and also these lines in a similar color. Now, why have I done this? Well, what I want to show is that when I do this 180 degree rotation, the pale blue band here, which is in the top band, will end up in the bottom band. There's also a pale blue band in the bottom band, which ends up in the top band. Let's have a look. Rotate around, rotate around and they seem to match perfectly. And it doesn't matter, my original geometry still seems to work. So that's a good indication that what I'm looking for is that the 180 degree rotation does indeed turn any point in the top band into a point in the bottom band and vice versa. Now, how am I going to prove this rigorously? Or maybe more rigorously than just saying, hey, look, it seems to be the case. Well, we're going to use the fact that this all lies in a plane and we're going to look at it side on. Just like that. Now, I've got some points labeled here. So I've got this point, this point, this point, and this point. Now, because the top band is the same height as the bottom band, the distance from the point at the bottom to the first point, the, I guess the lower middle point, is the same as the distance from the top to the upper middle point. That's just because we've slanted them the same amount. If you like, you can find some congruent triangles to convince yourself of that, but I'm just gonna take it as a fairly uh, direct geometric fact. So when we go back to look at it straight on, what we see is that distance from this point to this point is the same as the distance from this point to this point. Now again, we could chase through some uh, congruent triangles, but the key thing we're going to get out of this is this whole complete figure in that circle has got 180 degree rotational symmetry. So that when we rotate it through 180 degrees, everything matches. 
I guess what we're really picking up is that this point is diametrically opposed to this point. You could even say that we've got a rectangle here through the four white points. There are many ways you could get that. But essentially it relies on the fact that the distance from this bottom point to this point here and the distance from this top point to this point here, they're equal distances. Which is great. It shows that when we rotate this through 180 degrees, it maps the top band to the bottom band and the bottom band to the top band. So our area preserving transformation, which does that for every semicircle all at once, maps the top band to the bottom band, maps the bottom band to the top band. And so our deduction is that when we look at this area preserving transformation, the two bands have got to have equal area. This is Archimedes invariant. The height of one of those bands is the only thing that determines the surface area. Or the other way around, the surface area only depends on the height of the band. Now, from here to getting Archimedes formula requires that we think about the cylinder that goes around this sphere. But the details of that are the same as what Archimedes did. So that's not necessary to go through here. So that's where I'll finish this one for today. Thanks.